you so much, Reagan. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, I invite you to once again open them to the book of Revelation. All good things must come to a close eventually. And after tonight, we'll have one more message through the last book of the Bible. Many of you have been here for every message that we have taught and preached in this book. And we began a long time ago. How long? I don't even remember. But we're coming to a close next Sunday night. I'm going to be speaking on the subject of heaven. And if you want going to heaven, you might want to know a little bit about it before you get there. So I encourage you to come back next Sunday night. But tonight, we're going to be talking about the opposite of heaven. We're actually going to be talking about hell and some events that will lead into that. The great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20, beginning with verse 11. The Apostle John is writing about an event, a courtroom event, that will take place after the battle of Armageddon, after the return of Christ, after the disposal of of the Antichrist and the false prophet, after the disposal of the devil. As the wedding in heaven is winding up, Jesus the groom has married the bride, the church. And they're singing and shouting going on in heaven. Happiness is everywhere. While all of that has taken place, is taking place, there will be another situation taking place in a courtroom. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. It's called the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, verse 11 to the end of the chapter. John writes, Then I saw a great white throne, and I saw him who sat on it, that him is Jesus, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades, or hell, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We're going to be looking at a place called hell tonight. Actually, John is talking about the great white throne judgment, but hell is an overlap of that. So we're going to spend some time on hell on the front part and then the great white throne judgment on the back part. Now you don't hear much said about hell anymore. The old church used to preach it and teach it. The new church doesn't say nothing about it. In fact, hell today is basically ignored, redefined, mocked, or outright rejected by a majority of ministers, churches, and denominations. The latest poll that I have seen concerning ministers, not talking about lay people, not talking about deacons, not talking about finance committee people. The latest poll involving ministers, ministers of all denominations, both ministers of non-denominations. A poll was asked of them, and one of the questions in the poll is, do you believe in the biblical hell? 50% of them, one out of every two ministers that answered that question said, no, I do not believe in the biblical hell. That's why you don't hear much about it anymore. I told you this morning, a man preaches what he believes. And if a man doesn't preach on a certain subject, it's because he doesn't believe in that subject or doesn't believe in in it as the Bible has taught it. My job to teach you the whole counsel of God's Word. 
And that's what any minister should do. But many ministers are very selective what they preach because they are not going to preach what they don't believe. A theologian said this concerning hell. Hell has disappeared from the belief system of the 21st century church. Like so many other absurdities, it has no credence among those who are educated and enlightened. That's what he said. Another theologian said this. The concept of hell as a place of endless torment is bad doctrine that needs to be changed. The fact that God would send people to such torture makes him deranged or demented. A professor said this, Hell is not a place, but it's a state of being. It is an inner pain of a life that is lonely, frustrated, and empty. It's just a state of being. It's not a place. It's what you are on the inside, not what you're possibly going to face on the outside. An entertainer. (laughs) They're smart folks, aren't they? This is what an entertainer said. I can take the heat, and quite frankly, I look forward to going there with all of my rowdy friends to gamble, to drink, and chase women. A preacher said this about hell. God is love. And to suggest God would send someone to eternal torment is hate speech. That's what ministers are saying about hell. That's why there's no teaching or preaching on it in many places. Professors, preachers, theologians, evangelists, religionists, the the entertainers, the sophisticated, the enlightened, they all look at hell and they say it's nothing but a fantasy, a, a farce, a facade, a falsity. That's what they say. But I don't really care what they say. Quite frankly, I, I don't care. And you shouldn't either. The only thing that should matter to us is what does Jesus say? Because he tells the facts of the story. And Jesus believed in this place called hell. In fact, he talked about it in the Bible more than any other person did. He talked about it more than Paul or Peter or John. He talked about it more than any of the deacons may have done, any of other characters in the Bible may have done. Jesus spoke of hell more than any other character in the Bible. In fact, more than all the other characters in the Bible combined. He also spoke more about the subject of hell than he did baptism, the Lord's table, and tithing all together. Jesus believed in it. That's why he taught it. That's why he preached it. Now, if you go through the scriptures, and there's about 12 places where Jesus teaches in some way, shape, or form about this place called hell, you'll find that he has some remarkable things to say about it. First of all, he says it's real. Hell is real. It doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not, it's real. You may not believe in Disney World, but there's a Disney World, and if you go there, you'll find that out. So hell is real. It's not a fantasy. It's real. It's not a figment of the imagination. It's real. It's real. It's also a place where there's a separation from God. Down here, you're separated from God by sin. But there's always an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. And when you do that, that separation becomes a joint relationship. In hell, there's a separation from God that can never be changed. It's an eternal separation. Hell is a real place. It's a separation from God. It's also a place that those who reject Jesus Christ as their Savior, will be. Pastor, what sin will send a man to hell? No sin will send a man to hell. The rejection of Jesus Christ is what sends a man to hell. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. The soul that sinneth will die. 
It's not a particular sin. It's the sin of rejecting Him. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. If you won't allow Him to seek and save you, He can't save you and you'll perish. He will save whosoever calls upon His name. But if you persist in rejecting Him in this world, you will be separated from Him in the world to come. Hell is an eternal place. It's not a temporary place. You don't lease a spot there. It's a real place, and those who go there will be there for all eternity. It's a fiery place. Jesus himself said the fires never cease to burn. And he spoke of the fire as being something that torments but does not consume. Can you imagine having your body on fire, but the fire does not consume you, it just burns you. So you have forever the pain of the fire, but the fire never consumes you, and it never burns itself out. Hell is also a prison. You've heard me say many times that the Lord did not create hell for man. Now, man goes there if he rejects salvation through God's way of salvation, which is Christ Jesus. But hell was created for Satan and his demons. It's a prison for them. But if you choose to follow them, that's where they're going to take you. Hell is also inescapable. They said Alcatraz prison in San Francisco was inescapable. But they do have now evidence that some people got out of that prison alive. You will not get out of hell. I promise you that. It's it's a place that is inescapable. It's also a place of torment. The same Jesus who said the fires never cease to burn there also said the maggots never cease to eat. He talked about the worms. That word worm in the Greek is the word where you get maggots from. Can you imagine imagine maggots eating on you, but they never consume you? They're just constantly eating on you, but they don't consume you. Fire burns you, but it never consumes you. The fire never goes out. The maggots never stop eating. You say, is that a literal statement that Jesus said? I don't know, but that's bad enough even if it is non-literal. Hell is a dark place. Pitch black dark. It's a place of screams. You will hear people hollering and screaming, but you'll never see them. You'll be alone in a dark place full of torment from a God who wanted to save you but you rejected his salvation. It's a lonely place. Jesus described hell and all of those things. So he believed in it. He believed in hell because he taught on it. And I know Jesus believed in hell for one other reason. Not because he taught on it, because of right there. Why would he go to the cross Why would he suffer and die for the sins of the world if hell wasn't real? He wouldn't have. It would make no sense. But he was willing to go to the cross. He was willing to take literally our hell upon himself and pay for it in full that we could be forgiven and we could go to heaven. It's called substitutionary atonement. I should have been on that cross. I should have paid for my sins because I was the guilty one. But he set me free when I put my faith in him. And you can say the same thing if you're saved. That should have been you on the cross. But he loved you so much he took you down and put himself up. And he took all of your sins upon himself. The Bible says he who knew no sin became our sin. And on that cross, he suffered and bled and died for your sin and my sin for all eternity in six hours. Wow. Now, let's move to the great white throne judgment. 
Because hell is mentioned in what we just talked about. The first thing I want you to see is found in verse 11. Now we're going to work through the scriptures a little bit. I want us to see the setting of the great white throne judgment. Look at verse 11 with me. John is writing. He's telling you what he sees. I saw a great white throne. And him who sat on it. From whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. There found no place for them. I want us to think about the three words, the great white throne. Because that, the Bible names this day in court, this judgment that is going to take place in the future. Remember, the battle of Armageddon is over. Jesus is now on the throne in Jerusalem. Satan is in chains for a thousand years. Can't get away. He's chained up. He's in prison for a thousand years. He'll be released later, and that's another message for another day. The Antichrist was thrown into hell alive. The false prophet was thrown into hell alive. Those armies of the world that followed them at the Valley of Megiddo to stop the coming of Jesus. Jesus took care of them just like that. Remember, there was no battle to it. He just spoke the word, and they're destroyed. And the vultures came and had a nice meal. Their souls are in hell of those people while their flesh is being eaten by the vultures. All of that is taking place already. The wedding bells in heaven are winding it up. And the scene is now in a courtroom. And Jesus is sitting on the bench of the courtroom. It's called the great white throne where he's seated. Great speaks of the power that comes out of that throne. A judge has great power, does he not? In many cases, he's the final say in anything. Well, the great white throne, that word great speaks of the power that emulates out of that throne. We don't think, we think of people as being powerful, but John says the throne itself was powerful. Think about the word white. Why isn't it called the great blue throne or the great red throne? It's called the great white throne because it speaks of the purity of the one who sits on it. The, the one who sits on it is all powerful. The one who sits on it is all holy. And when he makes a judgment, it is righteous and it is true. And the throne speaks of the person who's on it. The great white throne. The one who sits on it's all powerful. The one who sits on it's all holy. The one who sits on it has a name. And his name is Jesus. The name that is above all name. The name at which one day every knee will bend. Every head will bow. Every tongue will broadcast. He is Lord to the glory of the Father. And the Father has deferred all judgment to the Son. God the Father said, Jesus, I'm giving you the judgment of the human race. You died for those who will receive you. I'm giving you the judgment of those who didn't. And the Lord Jesus, and this great courtroom of eternity, sits on the bench. And he's going to review each case that comes before him. He is a judicial God. And he's going to do things according to his judicial system. You say, how many people are in hell, Pastor? Billions. But they will all get their day in court at the great white throne judgment. One by one they will come. Not two by two. You won't bring mama and daddy with you. You won't bring a politician with you. You won't bring a policeman with you. You're not going to bring your good old buddy with you. You will come alone if you're at that courtroom. You will come alone. And you will stand before Jesus. 
You say, I don't believe in him. It doesn't matter whether you do or not. You'll stand before him. And one by one, your case will be looked at. Now, if you go to court, there's three major components of court. There's evidence, there's defense, and there's verdict. And each person who comes before Jesus at the great white throne judgment, their spirit has already been in hell. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord in heaven. To be absent from the body, if you don't know the Lord, is to be away from the Lord in hell. There's no purgatory. There's no waiting period. You die in Jesus, you go to heaven. If you die without Jesus, you'll be in hell. Hell will one day give up everybody it's got in it. For this day in court. This is not for the saved. This is not for the redeemed. This is for those who willfully rejected Jesus. Jesus will lay out the evidence. He's the prosecutor as well as the judge. He will lay out the evidence of each person's sin. And each person's rejection of him. You say, how will he do that? On a screen just like that. At least I believe it will be like that. I didn't say that, Lord. I did not say that. I didn't think that, Lord. I did not think that. I didn't feel that. I didn't do that. I didn't have that attitude. Lord, you're mistaken. You got bad information. You need to quit listening to people on the street, Lord. None of that's true. I've been framed. Oh, you really? There's the evidence. You know, the Bible says in that day, and I'll speak more about this in a minute, every thought will be revealed. Is that scary? Everything that you've ever thought that's wicked will be revealed. Everything you've ever felt that was wicked will be revealed. Everything you've ever said or done, the life that you've lived that's been wicked will be shown for all to see. Now this is for those who have rejected Jesus. The evidence will be presented. The defense will then have a chance to speak. I've already told you some of the things they'll say. I didn't do it. My brother was in a jail ministry for many years. I don't believe there's anybody in the jail system that ever did anything. They're all innocent people who were thrown in jail by by mistake. And everybody who stands before Jesus, none of them are going to admit they did anything wrong. They'll make excuses. They'll have denials. And Jesus will say, listen to them. They get their day. But he'll refute everything they say. By saying, what about that? What about this? What about that? What about this? The defense will be made as the evidence is presented. And then the verdict will be given. Guilty is charged. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. I never knew you. And back to hell they will go for all eternity. If you're here today without Jesus, you will be at that great white throne judgment. You'll be one of those who will stand before Judge Jesus. Evidence, defense, and verdict. That's the setting in verse 11. But let's move on now to verse 12. Because here we see the summons that's given. The summons that's given. John is going to tell us what kind of people will be there. You might be surprised. You say, Pastor, I know Adolf Hitler will be there. Bin Laden will be there. Napoleon will be there. Stalin will be there. Jack the Ripper will be there. But you know there will be other people there that might shock you. Notice in verse 12, John says, I saw the dead, small and great, little people, big people, 
Insignificant people, famous people. Secularist, sacredness. Religionist, pagans. He says, I saw them all. I saw all of the dead. They were small and they were great. And they were standing before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. If you're unsaved, your book is full of stuff. It is a huge book. Everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever felt, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done is not only put on a screen for you to see, it's recorded in a book. Now that's for people who are unsaved. What happened to the people who saved? Where's their book? Come on now. If your sin has been paid for in full, you have no sin, therefore your book has nothing in it. It's nothing but white pages. The blood of Jesus made you white as snow and made your book as white as snow. He's already paid for your sin. If he's paid for your sin, you can't do double jeopardy. He can't ask you to pay for it again. You are free in Christ. But those who have never been forgiven, now they must answer. They must answer. And all who are unsaved will be called on this day. No exceptions, no exemptions, no exclusions, no escapees, no excuses will be given. One by one they will come. Picture a courtroom. You ever been in a courtroom? Jesus will be behind the bench. And they will come. And they will stand before him. Evidence presented, defense given, verdict made. And that will go on continually. And by the way, nobody will never be found not guilty. Because every one of them there committed the most radical, dramatic sin you can commit. And what is that? The rejection of God's Son. That's why he will say to them, I don't know who you are. I never knew you. You could have known me. I could have known you. But you chose not to. So now the sins that you've committed are in the book. And you will answer for them and you will pay for them. I wonder who will be there. If you ever, let's give it some thought. Well, obviously outright sinners will be there, right? The profane, the vulgar, those who hate God, those who are hostile toward the people of God and the church of God. We have no problem with that group whatsoever. They deserve it. Amen? Would you not agree? Y'all pretty smart. If you say too, amen too loud, you're condemning yourself. Because we're all that. They acted it out. We just do it on the inside. That's why Jesus said, if you hate somebody in your mind, you've already murdered them with your hands. Well, none of us would murder anybody with our hands, I don't think. But we sure have a lot of hatred sometimes. And Jesus said hatred is equivalent to murder in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, lusting after somebody is just in the kingdom of God is just as bad as committing the fornication or the adultery with them. Pastor, I would never do that. What do you think about doing then? Oh, but I wouldn't do it. If you thought about doing it, you've already done it. You see, the Lord measures us not just by what we do, but what we think we would do if we could get away with it. What we feel like we could do if we could get away with it. The only reason some of us right now haven't murdered somebody is because we can't get away with it. Because if we could get our hands around them, we would. So outright sinners, also self-righteous people, though. Self-righteous people. You know anybody like that? I mean, they're just good people. They're salt-of-the-earth people. Give you the shirt off their back people. They're nice, they're polite, they're kind. They'll do anything for you if you ask them. They're self-righteous people. They're good and they do good things. But you don't go to heaven by being good. 
You listening to me? If you could go to heaven by being good, there wouldn't be a need for a cross. You cannot be good enough to go to heaven because there's none good. No, not one. Because remember, what is sin? It's not just what you say and do. It's what you think and feel. The best five seconds of my life, I couldn't save myself. Because why? In that five seconds, I'd be thinking about wanting to hurt somebody. Don't you look at me, you would too. Self-righteous people will be standing before Jesus at the great white throne. Lord, I was a pretty good guy. I was better than 75% of the people that I ever hung around with. Certainly, Lord, that counts for something. And Lord, I did good things. Do you remember what I did for my next door neighbor? Do you remember what I did for my church member? Do you know, Lord, what I did? I was good and I did good things, Lord. Certainly, that, past, that, that counteracts my bad. Guilty. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you. Outright sinners will be there. They will get the summons. Self-righteous people will get the summons. Procrastinators will get the summons. Second Corinthians tells us today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. I like how... Paul threw that in. Today is the day of salvation, but today's 24 hours. It only takes five minutes to die. So, not only is today should be the day of salvation, right now should be the day time. Because how many of you can promise me you'll be alive in five minutes? You say, Pastor, why do you say that? Because you could have a heart attack right now and be gone before you ever hit the floor, before we ever could get to you. You could have a stroke, a massive stroke could hit your brain and you're gone. And you could be sitting right next to somebody who's a medical professional and they can't do a thing for you. Procrastination. I know I need Jesus. I know I need a Savior. I know my life isn't what it should be, but I'll do something about it later. And you wait too long. And death doesn't announce when it's coming. It just comes. And it comes swiftly. It comes suddenly. And for some, it comes mighty early. And if you leave this world with the best intentions and you don't give your life to Jesus, it doesn't matter. Procrastination will stand before Him. Self-righteous will stand before Him. Outright, profane, vulgar people will stand before Him. Religious people. Religious people will stand before Him. Preachers will stand before Him. Didn't I preach for you, Jesus? Didn't I teach for you, Jesus? I never knew you. Depart from me. Prayer warriors. You prayed. You prayed often. But you never prayed the prayer to receive Christ. You prayed every other kind of prayer. Lord, get me out of jail. Lord, heal my body. Lord, get my children straight. You prayed. You were religious. You attended church. When the doors were open, you were there. You were baptized. You performed the rituals and the ceremonies of your religion. You knew what to say. You knew what to do. You were told if you said this and do this, you're home free. You had creeds that you did or spoke. You had causes you participated in. You were a religious person. The cream of the religious crop. But you never knew Jesus. You know, it's possible not to see Jesus because you can't see him because of religion. The religious leaders couldn't see him in his day. They were blinded by religion. 
The hardest people to reach for the Lord, listen to your pastor, is people who got religion. I can witness to a drunk in the gutter and get farther along with him about giving his life to Jesus than church people sitting in a pew full of their religion and they just don't listen. I believe, I said the prayer, I walked the aisle, I'm baptized, I've done what the church has said, I'm going to heaven. Who said you're going to heaven? Not the Lord. Because if you don't give your life to Him, deliberately, willfully, intentionally, call upon His name and ask Him to save you from your sin, He will not be your Savior. And it breaks my heart that the church is full of religion. And maybe you're one of them looking at me right now. You know that you're not saved. But you're full of your religion. You somehow think God's going to cut your deal because you're religious. And that's not the way it works. And there'll be one more that comes that day. People who have rejected the gospel. Revelation 7, God sends 144,000 Jewish men across the world to be evangelists, to preach Jesus. They go to every nation. They go to every person of every nation. And they preach the gospel in the language of every person of every nation. In Revelation chapter 11, God sends Moses and Elijah, or two prophets like them, to Jerusalem. They preach Jesus Christ to the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. They explain from the law how Jesus was a fulfillment of the law. The law is the Lord, and the Lord is the law. And they preach that message. Revelation 14, you recall, things are so bad on the earth that the evangelists can't get through. They're being slaughtered. The two prophets have been slain in Jerusalem. So God in His mercy raises up an angel. I believe it's Gabriel, but it could be another angel. And that angel stands on the one of the four corners of the earth. And he preaches the last gospel message to a lost and dying world of Jesus. An angel will preach. And every single human being will see the angel. They will hear the angel. They will be given a chance, one last chance to say yes. And most will say what? All of these kind of people, hopefully not your kind of people, will stand before Jesus. The setting, the summons, verse 12, time is getting away from us. The secrets of the great white throne judgment, verse 12. The books were opened. Another book was opened which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. While you're standing before Jesus, there might be an audience in the back. Billions of people waiting their turn, waiting for their name to be called, to stand before the Son of the living God. And everything will be revealed. The book will be opened. Since you never gave your life to Jesus, it's full. The evidence is up on the screen. Jesus will take you back to every time you've ever said anything that was wrong or wicked. You didn't think nobody knew. You don't think nobody knows what you do on the side. Cheat, drink, chase women. See, you can get away with it down here, but you won't get away with it up there. And if you deny it, it'll be put on the screen for everyone to see. Everyone to see. Luke chapter 12, verse 2. All things will be made known. What's done in the dark will be brought to the light. And then lastly... The sentence from the great white throne judgment. 
the setting, the summons, the secrets. But now let's look at the sentence. Remember Jesus is a what? He's a judge. Judges present the evidence. They examine it. They listen to the defense carefully. Then they make a decision. This is not a jury trial decision. This is a decision by the judge. And what will be the verdict? Look at verse 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into what? The lake of fire. If your name is not in the book of life, and it's not because that's why you're there, after everything is said and done, you will be pronounced guilty and you will be taken away. And you will be put into the lake of fire where you will be forever and ever and ever and ever. Now folks, that's scary stuff. It really is. But it's Bible truth. That's why Jesus loved us so much. He went there so we don't have to go what I just talked about. You can settle with God out of court. When I was writing this message, I was thinking about a ticket that I got when I was going through the state of Georgia. I deserved the ticket. I was just going down the road high, wide, and handsome, not paying attention to my speedometer. And I was probably doing about 80 to 90 miles an hour. And I was going through a little town in Georgia, coming back home after doing a revival. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So I pulled over. I was stopped for speeding. I knew what I did. And the officer got out. We had some chitter chatter. He got my information, come back and said, I'm going to have to write you a ticket for speeding. It's going to take some points off. Probably your insurance is going to go up. And I'm going to have to make you pay a fine. I'm going to set up a day in court for you to come back in two weeks. If you want to make an appeal to the judge, you can then. But right now, this is what the situation is. You're charged with speeding, going to cost you points. Your insurance is going to go up. And the fine, it was several hundred dollars, I think, if I remember correctly. He said, but you can come back and appeal it. The judge will probably knock it down a little bit if you come back. I said, but sir, I live in South Carolina, as you can see. I, I don't want to have to come all the way here, back here. It's not worth my time. It's not worth my money to do that. Can you offer me another option? <laughs> he said, what I can do if you want to settle right now is I will reduce the ticket from a, from a charge that would put points on your license to a charge that will not put points on your license. I will change it from speeding to something else. I, I might have been reckless driver to some. I don't know what it was. But the fine went down a little bit. He said, you can settle with me right now. And you won't have to come back. We can settle the case right now. You can settle out of court, so to speak. And I said, officer, you got a deal. He wrote me the ticket. It wasn't for speeding. No points went off my license. My insurance didn't go up. And the ticket was a little bit less than what it would have been if it was speeding. That's what God wants to do with us. He doesn't want us to have to go to a day in court. He wants to work out a settlement out of court. And you know how he does that? You give your life to Jesus, and all of it changes. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There's no guilt. The guilt has been taken care of. Don't you like that? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.